I've got a great idea to share. Um, and this idea is uh, a timely idea because it has to do with these people, the young people. It has to do with really radically changing technologies. Um, when you look at the automobile and you look at how the automobile is manufactured, especially new automobiles like the Tesla, we're even looking at autonomous vehicles. The automobile you find, we find, is a snapshot of the technology of the day, right? Um, from energy, from fuel efficiency, to safety, to um, comfort and luxury. So you look at the interior, for example, of the Tesla, and it's, it's like the iPhone, right? It's, it's, your, it's, it's all of the electronics integrated into the car, and it's there because of the way the car is manufactured. Same with the airplane. The airplane for a while has been autonomous, many of the, the big, you know, uh, airliners. Um, but if you look at the, even the environments inside a, a plane, um, they're extremely comfortable. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of investigation, a lot of research on lighting, on appropriate lighting, circadian rhythms, and, you know, and um, the, the interior of the plane is, is industrialized, it's manufactured. In fact, the automobile um, is perfected once, right? and then mass produced. We don't see that so much in housing. We don't see that, that much in, in buildings in general. So the question is, can we, can we grab a hold of this technology? Can we rethink the way we build buildings to embrace the technology that we have out here now with the CNC process and the manufacturing processes and apply it to building, to building architecture? Um, a few years ago, Corning Glass came out with this, this video. It was called A Day Made of Glass. And it was a really inspiring video. It, it was a walk through the life of a family, and it showed the Corning Glass products, but it, it, it was really about integrated technology in the home. But it didn't really exist. Now we're partnered with Corning, and we're actually making real life houses of the future. Um, experiments where we're integrating technology in, into the home. But this is the problem. The construction industry has been so much of the same for so many years um, and unwilling to change, to adapt, to embrace new technologies for building because they're just set in their ways. So with research at Tech, I mean, imagine this. Imagine trying to get that house made of glass installed on a job site like this in the rain with a million different participants involved in the construction of it, unsecure. Um, it's got to change. This is a Lumen House. It's a, one of our research projects from, from Virginia Tech. It's the School of Architecture, Interior Design, and and industrial design with mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, many, many collaborators. But this was the, the third of the solar, solar houses for the Department of Energy. This went to Europe and won first place in the solar decathlon competition. It beat all the Europeans in energy. So we were pretty thrilled with that because it's, it's tough to beat those Germans in energy. Um, but we did it. Um, and one of the reasons, there's two reasons why this did so well. One was it was a smart home, and I say smart, is that the, the computer, the house control system, managed every little bit of energy used in the house. We were very careful with, with the energy use, and we knew where it was all going. And the second is that the house was modular, that, that, that we were able to build it ahead of time in the U.S. and then ship it to... Madrid, Spain, which is where the competition was. After that, we decided to, to really run with this idea of smart homes. And for many reasons, but one of the reasons is, is energy. So in order to really make a net zero energy house, we, 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 have, to, um, we have to rethink how we build it. Because a, a net zero energy house is hard to do, and it takes some sophisticated uh, electronics. So what we did, this is, uh, we, we designed a library of components that would make up a home. Uh, kitchens, bathrooms, 
In this case, it's a home office that converts into a guest bedroom. But one thing you'll notice about all these components is they're individual. They're two foot six wide, 18 feet long, and eight feet tall. And they're small enough that they can be built in a factory. So we start by coming up with a frame, basically a shell, or a cartridge we call it, which we install the house systems in. In this case, it was the cartridge for the kitchen. Now the cabinet makers love this, right? Because for the first time ever, they're getting a site to install their kitchen that's perfectly square and absolutely precise. Was well, square and precise because this box was fabricated in a factory with CNC machinery. So it's absolutely to the thousands of an inch precise. We then went on and build, built all of those elements and now we have a whole home full of cartridges that are really portable. So years ago, um, I did a white paper for the Modular Building Institute and they asked me to critique the modular building industry. It's like, take a look at it and, and, and tell us what we're doing right, what are we doing wrong. And in my white paper, I really critique the problem with modular construction is that they're building big boxes and shipping them on the road and then stacking the boxes and they call it modular. And this is kind of backwards. Instead of shipping space, we really, really have to think about shipping technology, not space. Smaller elements, but big elements that are substantial units of a home. So now that we have the platform for doing this, we're going to have a little bit of fun with doing this. So we started the Internet Thing Kitchen. We teamed up with computer science. See, I'm talking faster now. It's great. We teamed up with computer science. We teamed up uh, with the industrial designs, architect designs, and, and we made this ultimate kitchen. And uh, we're bringing forward technology. We're integrating screens. We're making interfaces to the home where you've never seen interfaces before. We're embracing something called multimodal interfaces. Ways to interact with your home that, you know, that are out now. Uh, voice uh, recognition, voice control, motion control, um, touch to open, um, you know, iPad, iPhone, you know, it's all, it's all there. Um, and the kitchen is, is pretty amazing. Um, it's traveled to many trade shows. Um, this was at the Las Vegas in... Uh, the kitchen and bath industry show in Vegas. And it's demonstrating all of the things that we've been able to do with the kitchen because we've had it as an isolated, as a standalone element. And you know, we're, we're investigating, we're working with this to see what we can do. So camera in the oven to monitor cooking, uh, sensors in the refrigerator that monitors your, your uh, groceries, reservoirs for, uh, for soap, for the, the, for the uh, dishwasher, um, so it automatically dispenses and alerts you when you're running out of soap. Um, hand, touch hands-free on and off for the kitchen sink. Um, gesture control for the temperature control, right? It all sounds crazy, and it all sounds a little bit too much, right? But one thing I've noticed in working on this is that some great things are happening. Um, things with electronic and um, multimodal controls that might make a home much easier for a handicapped person to live in or even a family with a handicapped person in there because there's adjustability and things you can do. The other big, big issue with housing is the concept of aging in place. Is um, how, how do you design a home where the homeowner can live in it as long as possible without having to move out. And so we're, we're discovering by building these prototypes how many opportunities we may find to make these, these to, 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 to integrate these, these technologies. But here's the thing, that kitchen that you just saw, as high tech as it was, packages up like this. I like to say gift wrapped. We then went on and we, uh, the following year, one year later, we did the bathroom of the future. Um, here's where we're starting to get into to these ideas of adjustability. The vanity raises and lowers. It recognizes you when you're in the bathroom. It knows who you are. 
and it will adjust your vanity height to, to your setting. The lower drawer under the sink can pull out and it instantly becomes a handicap accessible sink. My son coming in, seven years old, can touch the side. The sink lowers, he can brush his teeth. The lighting comes on, we have a smart mirror. You get your, your interface for the whole bathroom is the smart mirror where you can engage, interact, do presets on your hot water and whatever. But also important is it, it's the house gives you information. Um, it gives you information on how much energy you just used when you took that shower and how much water you just used when you took the shower. You may want to track it, you may not, but the key is that you have access to that information. So um, we're having fun at Virginia Tech. We're looking for where this, this, this technology can really go. But I think the most important part of it is that it's in the actual building of these things It's where the discoveries are, are, are happening. Here's, here's a great, uh, that little button there is, is the Amazon Dash button, right? Before, when the soap for the dishwasher uh, ran empty, um, before we had the house send you a text message to let you know that the soap was empty. And I remember giving a lecture on this and I got yelled at. It's like, you know, I don't want a text message from my dishwasher, right? And I said, well, we've done better than that because now we've activated, we figured out how to activate the dash button. So it automatically orders the soap for you. You get, a, you get an email, you know, so notification. But, but you know, this is fun. This is fun. Um, we're integrating certain things. This is a way to keep the kids in the bathtub for more than 10 minutes, right? Uh, videos, projected Netflix. And then, of course, there's a smart mirror with it. And the beauty of it, okay, back to the, the architecture of this, that's two bathrooms. That's the master bathroom and the guest bathroom that share a co common plumbing wall, but it's full of the technology. Technology that can't be delivered on a job site in the rain with thousands of different subcontractors. We then went on and uh, built the living room. This was uh, exhibited in Atlanta at the AIA show. Um, and this was all about light. So in one of the previous lectures, someone mentioned Make sure you turn the light off when you leave the bathroom. You don't even have to think about it anymore because that light is off when you leave the bathroom. Not only that, when you leave the bathroom, the little cleaning Roomba robot uh, makes its way around and cleans the floor after you, right? Um, but this was about light. This is about now working with psychology and looking at the psychology of comfort of light and presetting light in the room based on the task you're doing. So a different kind of you know, color temperature, Kelvin temperature, color and white light. Um, reading a book, working on a computer, watching TV, cleaning, vacuuming. So the, the home starts to recognize these tasks you're doing uh, and then responds to the, the, the proper light that you need. You know, with a lot of these experiments, we find just as many things we shouldn't do as things we should. But the discoveries are great. Here is that entire exhibition packed up. Because they're two foot wide, they fit on a flatbed truck, eight foot wide, and 53 feet long, you get a whole house. So um, no oversized permits. So back before where they're shipping big clumsy boxes, we're now very efficient. As an experiment to test this idea, not on a smart house, but just, just on a regular house, myself and two students, um, little venture capital, <laughs> little side uh, investigation with our own money. We built this little house in Charlottesville. Some would say it's a big house, it's 2,200 square feet. 13 cartridges, two floors, right? 13 cartridges, Up, upper floor, lower floor. Prefabricated them in a little warehouse, installed all our systems, all the electrical, all the plumbing, the tile work, the lighting, everything was there, even the appliances when it moved into place. And in one day, it took about a month to install those. One day we stacked these. Eight hours later, we had a roof in place. And I like to call this <clears throat> building a house from the inside out. Right now, they come in, they'd stick frame the house. 
and you'd install all your systems. It's different now. Now you install your systems and build the rest of the house around it. There was the house. It was built in record time. It was sold uh, for the asking price. So it was extremely successful. And it was just built by myself and, and, and two other guys, um, which was a, you know, if you, if you put this in the hands of manufacturers, you're going to get much more efficiency. Here you can kind of see the cartridge that has the cabinets, but the infill walls around it close in the room. So it's really a hybrid of construction. It's the cartridge and then infill framing around. Quite different house, but this is a project that's slated to be constructed on campus at Virginia Tech at the, the big research park off 460. But we see this as a test cell building. It's a building that we're going to construct for exploring different, different types of cartridges. We're going to look at hospital rooms. We're going to look at hotel rooms. We're going to look at elderly care facilities, um, medium and high density housing, concepts of architecture of small space, like rooms that can convert. They're a bedroom, they're a living room by day, a bedroom by night. Um, how, do we, how do we live in the city in a 300 square foot apartment? You know, how do we make housing affordable, you know, in the city? It's just out of control right now. So someone asked, what, what are we doing different at Virginia Tech? And I don't know if it's different, but I know what works is that we're building the ideas. We're prototyping. We're failing from it, but we're also succeeding from it. Um, like in this case, we invited a family, we had a dinner party, it was a pizza party, and we really observed, you know, how is it working? How does it work? What can we change? How can we improve it? The last story, the story I'll end on, and this, this takes the craziness to something that's really practical, is that text message, that text message that was sent when your soap dispenser uh, was running low, well, that soap dispenser is sitting on a, a scale, a weight scale, a sensor. We took that technology and transferred into the, the bathroom floor where if you stand in one location, your weight comes up on the mirror. <laughs> okay, again, I got yelled at. Oh, what, I don't want my weight on the mirror. I say, yes, but you know something amazing? When the bathroom detects a fall, it notifies a caregiver of whoever fell in the bathroom that, that something has happened. You may want to check in on grandma. So that's, that's a great, we're, we're now working with the Department of Gerontology at Tech, and we're really looking at how do we embrace technology to, to really improve our lives from when we're born to when we're 90 years old. Thank you.